Okay, well, good morning, everybody. I'd like you to turn with me and your Bibles to the book of Joel once again to chapter 2, and we're going to read from verse 18 down to verse 27, and we're going to think about God the Restorer and how wonderful it is that he not only sometimes wounds us for our own benefit, but he also heals, and so we're going to see his restoration in verse 18. And it begins with this word, then, uh, after this repentance that we've been considering, then will the Lord be jealous for his land and pity his people. Yea, the Lord will answer and say unto his people, Behold, I will send you corn and wine and oil, and you shall be satisfied therewith, and I will no more make you a reproach among the heathen. But I will remove far off from you the northern army and will drive him into a land barren and desolate with his face toward the East Sea and his hinder part toward the utmost sea and his stink shall come up and his ill savor shall come up because he hath done great things. Fear not, O land, be glad and rejoice. For the Lord will do great things. Be not afraid, ye beasts of the field. For the pastures of the wilderness do spring. For the tree beareth her fruit. The fig tree and the vine do yield their strength. Be glad then, ye children of Zion. And rejoice in the Lord your God. For he hath given you the former rain moderately. And he will cause to come down for you the rain, the former rain and the latter rain in the first month. And the floor shall be full of wheat, and the fats shall overflow with wine and oil. And I will restore to you the years that the locust hath eaten, the cankerworm and the caterpillar and the palmer worm, my great army which I sent among you. And you shall eat in plenty and be satisfied and praise the name of the Lord your God that hath dealt wondrously with you, and my people shall never be ashamed. And ye shall know that I am in the midst of Israel, and that I am the Lord your God, and none else, and my people shall never be ashamed. And again, God will bless that reading from his precious word to us. And again, what a what a joyful reading in the in the midst of all that we've been reading about, about the, the sufferings that they've gone through. And so we said that uh, our last session, we were looking at sincere repentance. What is so fascinating about the book of Joel is that no record is given as to whether the people and the priests acted upon this urgent trumpet call to repentance. It's not stated that the National Assembly, the solemn assembly of repentance was ever convened. However, what Joel does is tell us this is how God would act if his people repented. Now, again, we don't know whether they did or they didn't. We don't know any of the details. It's just completely uh, absent from the text. But what we can see from this is that when his people come in sincere repentance, God is ready to pardon and willing to bless abundantly. That's the way he responds to a people who repent. And so, again, why would we ever hold back from genuine repentance when we get a glimpse of what God does in response to a repentant, broken people. And remember, as we thought about how we're going to approach this book, we said that it begins, in a sense, with barrenness. And we, we had the effects of the first locust plague, the threat of the second local locust plague. So we began with barrenness. And then we said that we have to go through this valley of brokenness, if we want to come through into this time of blessing. And so how do we make that exchange from barrenness to blessing? It's always through the valley of brokenness. So we've, we've kind of gone through that cycle, at least uh, as we've been reading this book. And so this really is the watershed of the prophecy. Uh, it, now it's all changing. From this point on, 
it's going to be blessing, blessing, blessing. <laughs> and so we're, we're moving into a time of great blessing. And so we're going to see, first of all, in 18 through 27, the immediate response to Israel's repentance. Whether it happened or not, this is what God's immediate response would be if there was sincere, genuine repentance. And so we're going to see that. And then from verse 28 to the end of the book, we're going to see the ultimate response to Israel's repentance. Because we do know, don't we, from our study in the book of Zechariah, that there's coming a day when there will be national repentance, when they look upon him whom they've pierced, they mourn for him, there's going to be a time of great brokenness, and then a time of unprecedented blessing for that nation. And so uh, there's an ultimate response to Israel's repentance we'll see from verse 28 to the end of the book. So we want to think about, in verses 18 and 19, the reason God is blessing them. And first of all, we notice that it comes after this time of sincere repentance uh, that we've, we've read about from verse 12 down to verse 17. But in verse 18 and 19, it, it reads this way, Then will the Lord be jealous for his land and pity his people. Yea, the Lord will answer and say unto his people, Behold, I'll send you corn, wine, and oil. You shall be satisfied therewith. I will no more make you a reproach among the heathen. And so we notice that it begins with that phrase, then. I, I like that. It's just kind of, it's very important to see that. Pay attention to that word then. As a result of what we've seen in 12 through 17, when there is this set of circumstances, a people who are repentant, who are sincere, who are broken in the presence of God, it says, then. <laughs> this is how God is going to respond. It's a beautiful promise. Then will the Lord. And notice uh, again, this whole comes all thing comes out of the fact that he's jealous. The Lord will be jealous for his land and pity his people. So the root cause of the positive answer is the Lord's pity for his people. And so we, we notice uh, verse 18, the reason for the answer is the Lord's jealousy for his land, the Lord's pity for his people. And the result of the answer is from verse 19 through 27. It's this outpouring of blessing. Because God is jealous for his land, because the Lord pities his people, then these things are going to occur once they come to him in repentance. I want to think about the jealousy of God a little bit. He's a God both jealous and pitiful. By the way, wonderful attributes of God, jealous and pitiful. When we use jealous, sometimes we use it in a very negative way of human beings. But when it comes to God, jealous is always used in a positive, good sense. He's, after all, the creator of all and the owner of all. When you make something, you own it. It's yours, right? And so he created us and he made us. And he is worthy of total allegiance from those who owe their very existence to him. And so he's jealous when our affections wander. So I want to think about the jealousy of God. I want to talk about it in different ways. First of all, he's jealous for his land. We see that first of all here in verse 18, he is jealous for his land. Notice, by the way, whose land he's jealous about? His land. Just a, just a thought do we do we suspect that he's changed on that issue or not? Or does he still have a jealous interest in that piece of real estate? I think he still has some definite interest in that piece of real, real estate that he calls his land. So he's jealous for his land. But he's also jealous in other ways. He's jealous for his people, over the welfare of his people. It's good to know that, isn't it, that that he, he, he's very jealous over the welfare of his people. He, he takes it very personally when people treat his people badly. And so I want to just look at a couple of examples, uh, both of them in the book of Zechariah, one that we've studied. Uh, and we'll, we'll just notice, and we're in a close neighborhood in Joel to Zechariah. We're not too far away 
But in Zechariah 1 verse 14, we read this. So the angel that communed with me said unto me, Cry thou, saying, Thus saith the Lord of hosts, I am jealous for Jerusalem and for Zion with great jealousy. Look at Zechariah chapter 8 verse 2. Thus saith the Lord of hosts, I was jealous for Zion with great jealousy, and I was jealous for her with great fury. Now, in both cases, as we look at the uh, book of Zechariah, uh, why God was so jealous for his people is because they were being oppressed by Gentile powers. And God gets very jealous when his people suffer oppression by evil powers. And so we certainly uh, see that there. He's jealous for his people. We could look at some other uh, examples in the prophets. Look at Ezekiel for a minute. A couple of references in Ezekiel. Ezekiel 36 and verses 5 and 6, where we read this, Therefore thus saith the Lord God, surely in the fire of my jealousy have I spoken against the residue of the heathen and against all Idumea, which have appointed my land unto their possession with the joy of all their heart, with despiteful minds, to cast it out for a prey. Prophesy, therefore, concerning the land of Israel, say unto the mountains, and to the hills, to the rivers, and to the valleys, Thus saith the Lord God, Behold, I have spoken in my jealousy and in my fury, because you have borne the shame of the heathen. So again, another example where clearly uh, God's jealousy is seen because the heathen are treating both his people and his land in a way that uh, b provokes his jealousy. Uh, they're his people, his land. He doesn't want them to be mistreated in any way, and it provokes his jealousy. Chapter 38 of Ezekiel and verse 19, where we read this, For in my jealousy and in the fire of my wrath have I spoken, surely in that day there shall be a great shaking in the land of Israel. Of course, in this instance, it's because of the invasion of Gog and Magog, this northern invasion into the land of Israel. And God's jealousy is provoked. And he says, for in my jealousy and in the fire of my wrath have I spoken. And there's going to be a great shaking uh, in the land. And he's going to deal with the northern army that invades very clearly in that day uh, in a very dramatic way. And then just one more reference again in the Minor Prophets and Zephaniah. Chapter 3 and verse 8. Just kind of showing from Scripture God's jealousy for his land and for his people, uh, Israel. And chapter 3 and verse 8, we read this, Therefore wait ye upon me, saith the Lord, until the day that I will rise up to the prey, for my determination is to gather the nations that I may assemble the kingdoms to pour upon them mine indignation, even all my fierce anger, for all the earth shall be devoured with the fire of my jealousy. And of course, in the day of the Lord, part of his jealousy is being provoked because these people are intending in wiping out, the nations are going to try and wipe out his people Israel and God's fury and his jealousy will be once again provoked. So he's jealous for his people. He's jealous for his land. He's jealous for his own glory. Thinking about the God being jealous. And again, let's go back to the book of Ezekiel, chapter 39, and verse 25. It says, Therefore, thus saith the Lord God, now will I... Bring again the captivity of Jacob and have mercy upon the whole house of Israel and will be jealous for my holy name. Aha, uh -huh. jealous for my holy name. He's he's concerned about his name. And you see, uh, Israel are connected forever indelibly with his name. And so their success reflects on his name. Their demise reflects on his name. By the way, Christian also has a big reflection, doesn't it, on his name. So we better be careful how we behave because we want people to have a good sense of Christ. And that's why we're called ambassadors. I hope we're being good ambassadors for the Lord Jesus Christ today. Uh, again, just uh, back in Isaiah's prophecy, chapter 48, again, God jealous for his name, jealous uh, for his own glory. Isaiah 48 
and verse 11 is a lovely scripture. For mine own sake, even for mine own sake, will I do it. For how should my name be polluted? And I will not give my glory unto another. God is jealous about his name. Uh, he's jealous for his own glory. He's not going to share his glory with another. By the way, isn't that an, a wonderful affirmation for us of the absolute deity of the Lord Jesus? If he could pray, Father, glorify me with the glory that I had with thee before the world was, and the Father would do that, <laughs> uh, I have glorified it. I will glorify it again. You, you see, the fact that God is glorifying his son Jesus when he says, I will not give my glory to another, proves without question that the Lord Jesus is God manifest in flesh. Oh, there's so many. The, the weight of the evidence for the absolute deity of the Lord Jesus is overwhelming in Scripture. And how we thank God uh, for the one who came into this world uh, as the one who was truly, truly God and yet fully human without sin. First Corinthians chapter one now, New Testament reference to God's jealousy for his glory. Wonderful portion of scripture. We often delight in it. Uh, it feels like it gives us uh, an in uh, to be in any way useful for the Lord. And so we, we break in verse 26. For you see your calling, brethren, how that not many wise men after the flesh, not many mighty, not many noble are called. God has chosen the foolish things of the world to confound the wise. God has chosen the weak things of the world to confound the things which are mighty, base things of the world, and things which are despised hath God chosen, yea, and things which are not, to bring to naught things that are, that no flesh should glory in his presence. And by the way, in a very practical note for all of us, if, if you want to be set aside in your usefulness for God, then take to yourself the glory that belongs to God alone, and you'll soon be set aside and no longer useful. On the other hand, if you want to be continually usable for the Lord, be sure to give God all the glory for any good that ever comes out of your life in any service, give him the glory. To God be the glory, great things he has done. And oh, how we need to be recognized. He's jealous for his glory, and it would be a very uh, fitting thing for us to be also jealous for his glory and want him to get the glory through and through. And then uh, here's another one about the jealousy of God. He's jealous over the affections of his people. It bothers him when our hearts wander away from him. Wow, it's an amazing thought. We go back to the book of Exodus, chapter 20, and verse 5, the famous Decalogue, Ten Commandments. And here it says, Then shalt thou shalt not bow down thyself to them, as to idols, nor serve them, for I, the Lord thy God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children, the third and fourth generation, them that hate me. Exodus 34, verse 14. Again, God's jealousy for the affections of his people. 34, 14. For thou shalt worship no other God, for the Lord whose name is Jealous is a jealous God. Look into the book of Deuteronomy now, please. Just I want you just to see this. God is very jealous about the affections of his people. Uh, he's done so much for us. He wants our love and he wants our allegiance. Deuteronomy 32 and verse 16. They provoked him to jealousy with strange gods, with abominations provoked they him to anger. Down in verse 21, same chapter, Deuteronomy 32, 21. They have moved me to jealousy with that which is not God. They have provoked me to anger with their vanities, and I will move them to jealousy with those which are not a people. I will provoke them to anger with a foolish nation. And then one more reference, 
as we think of God's jealousy for the affections of his people in the book of Psalms, the 78th Psalm and verse 58, for they provoked him to anger with their high places, moved him to jealousy with their graven images. And so the Lord is very jealous of anything or anyone in our lives that steals our affections away from him. And you think, oh, that's just Old Testament. No, it isn't. First Epistle of John, chapter 5, verse 21. My little children, keep yourself from idols. And our idols may be different to Israel's idols of old, but the idea is simply this. If something is stealing my affection from the Lord, then it's an idol. Anything that I love more than the Lord Jesus is an idol in my life. And so, again, um, be careful about these things. Uh, again, we got God is jealous. So we read that his blessing now comes partly because he is jealous for his land. And so... Uh, he doesn't reluctantly grant his blessing. It's something that flows freely out of the abundant mercy of his heart. Remember, they in, in the repentance, they called upon him because he is merciful and all of these things. And he's, he's going to restore the pros prosperity that they had lost. Uh, being jealous, it's his zeal for the protection of his own honor and also... Uh, it denote, denotes the defense of this relationship that he has with his people that brooks no rival. He doesn't want any revive, rival um, to his affections. So Jehovah's relationship with his land. And again, we've talked about the fact that it is his land. It almost seems as if the devastation of the land by the locusts, then the mockery of the heathen, provoke the Lord to jealousy along with the repentance of his people. Now, notice again, verse 17, uh, this reproach of the heathen. It says again, uh, let the priests and ministers of the Lord weep between the porch and the altar and let them say, spare thy people, O Lord, give now thine heritage, give not thine heritage to reproach that the heathen should rule over them. Wherefore should they say among the people or the heathen, where is their God? And so again, when there's mockery, Amongst the, the Gentiles, amongst the heathen, uh, it provokes God to action. And so it provoked him to feelings of jealousy for his land uh, in his heart because of the mockery of the heathen and also because of the devastation on the land. And so we read in verse 19, Yea, the Lord will answer and say unto his people. So again, here's the promise of the answer to their repentant, broken cries. Remember that we saw last time, 12 through 17. Here's the Lord's answer. He will answer and say to his people, Behold, and I want you to notice the, the, the constant reference from now on to the phrase, I will. So he says, Behold, I will send you corn. Good verse 20. But I will remove far off from you the northern army and will drive him into a land barren. Uh, verse uh, 23, be glad then, you children of Zion, and rejoice in the Lord your God, for he hath given you the former rain moderately, moderately, and he will cause to come down the rain, the former rain. Verse 25, I will restore to you the years the locusts have eaten. So again, it's all pointing to the fact this is this is what God is going to do. I will, I will, I will. He's going to do these things. He will answer and say to his people. And by the way, it's a proof of a restored relationship, isn't it? That God is now speaking to his people. He's answering his people. I, I will answer and say to his people, a pardon is now enjoyed. A relationship is restored. And three of the, the, the main products that had been itemized in chapter one that had been decimated by the locust plague. plague. Look at verse 20. Um, sorry, uh, verse 10 of chapter 1. The field is wasted, the land mourns, for the corn is wasted, the new wine is dried up, the oil languisheth. 
now in restoration, what is God giving them? I will send you, he says, corn, verse 19 of chapter 2, and wine and oil. The very things that had been withered away, he is now restoring. I'm going to send you those things. And so the corn, the wine, the oil, the three very commodities that had suffered under the locust plague, he is now restoring to them. And the Lord will also use these full harvests, not only to fill the mouths of his people, but also to shut the mouths of the heathen who are saying, where is your God? You see, in other words, the reproach is being removed. They were looking on and saying, oh, well, if look how God looks after his people. They've had these terrible, terrible locust plagues. The whole place is a barren wilderness. Uh, what kind of a God is this? Because remember, their gods were so connected in their minds with fertility, prosperity, all of these things. And so the heathen are looking on and saying, what kind of a God is this? God has removed their reproach. He has filled their mouths with good things, and he has also shut the mouths of the heathen. The, the, the nation cynically sneered at Israel's humiliation. We'll have no more to say. By the way, it's kind of interesting, isn't it, that as satanic deception in our world increases and intensifies, disdain of Israel becomes greater. I've never seen such hostility to the nation of Israel in on this continent that I'm seeing right now. Irrational. People don't even want to know the facts. They're not even interested in the facts. There's this satanic disdain of the nation of Israel. But the Lord always has the last word. And he will one day vindicate his people. <laughs> we can be sure of that. And so here he's going to shut their mouths. And in the coming day, he's going to shut the mouths of all these people who are speaking uh, terribly of his ancient people, Israel. Their mouths will be shut. But what about the New Testament church. See, this true repentance that we saw detailed in 12 through 17 brought about a, a, a terrific change. Now God is blessing. He's sending corn, he's sending wine, sending oil, satisfying them. And he says, I'll no longer make you approach among the heathen. And it is interesting, isn't it, that in the New Testament, one of the things that God does when he is really working amongst his people is he vindicates his presence amongst his people. And I want to just look at one verse, 1 Corinthians 14, verse 25. talks about uh, an unbeliever coming in to the assembly of God. And it says in verse 25, And thus are the secrets of his heart made manifest, and so falling down on his face, he will worship God and report that God is in you of a truth. Isn't it wonderful when the, the presence of God is so evident amongst the people of God that even unbelievers have to acknowledge God is here. Oh, how we long for that for our assemblies to have such a sense of the presence of God that if an unsaved person comes in, they would just be com confess, God is here. <laughs> There's no question God is here. Oh, how we long for that. And that is often the case in a time when the church has come to repentance and come into revival. One of the things that the world acknowledges, God seems to be everywhere, but especially amongst his people. And you see that in revival, people flocking to the church because they know God is there. And they want to be part of that. They want to hear from God. It's a wonderful thing. And that's what we should yearn for and pray towards and make sure that we are uh, these repentant people that God can bless. Notice verse 20. It says, But I will remove far from you the northern army and will drive them into a land barren and desolate with his face toward the east sea, his hinder part, hinder part toward the utmost sea, and his stink shall come up, and his ill savor shall come up before, uh, because he had done great things. So this is a, a quite a lengthy verse, 
dealing with the invader, but it's a very remarkable verse. And it's almost like the Lord is taking special pains to assure his people that he has dealt with their major concern. Their major concern is this massive locust plague. And so they'd been, they'd been a scourge to them. And there's this second one threatened. And so what is the Lord going to do? Remember, the, the locusts were his army, so they're under his command. And when their mission was over, the same Lord could dismiss them from his service just as well as he recruited them for his service. And so this attacking army of locusts would suffer a humiliating end. They would be between the East Sea, which is the Dead Sea, and the utmost sea, the Mediterranean Sea. In a wilderness area between those two places, the heaps of unburied, decaying locust corpses would fill the air with a stifling stench. That's how God's going to deal with this army. Now, we said that this was a literal locust plague, but it was also a foreshadowing of future events. And I want to think again about an invasion from the north. Remember, I will remove far off from you the northern army. God is going to deal with a northern army that invades the land. So we got to go back to Ezekiel. It seems like we're doing a lot of cross-referencing to the book of Ezekiel today, but that's good. Uh, again, just amazing how Scripture harmonizes so beautifully together. Uh, you cannot help but notice the correspondence between these two passages in Joel and as he foreshadows this northern invasion in Ezekiel. So we'll, we'll break in in Ezekiel 38, and verse 15. It says, And thou shalt come from thy place out of the north parts, thou and many people with thee, all of them riding upon horses, a great company and a mighty army. Notice, please, now chapter 39 and verse 4. Thou shalt fall upon the mountains of Israel, thou and all thy bands, and the people that is with thee, I will give thee unto the ravenous birds of every sort, and to the beasts of the field to be devoured. And then one more reference, 39 and verse 11, and we want you to pay attention to the stench here. And it shall come to pass in that day that I will give unto Gog a place there of graves in Israel, the valley of the passengers on the east of the sea, and it shall stop the noses of the passengers. It'll stop the noses of the passengers. In other words, there's going to be a strong stench from the corpses of this army that God defeats that have come upon his land. And it shall stop their noses of the passengers, and there shall they bury Gog and all his multitude. They shall call it the Valley of Haman Gog. So again, it's just hard not to see a correspondence between these two passages and say that this locust plague, although it was a literal plague that was threatening the land of Israel, it's a foreshadowing of another invasion, a northern army that God is going to bring. He's going to put a hook in their jaws and bring them into the land. And so, again, just like he, uh, this army was his army, in a sense, Gog thought, thought he's in control here, but he wasn't. Just as the locusts thought they were in control, but they weren't. The Lord was in control. Verse 21, it says, Fear not, O land, be glad and rejoice, for the Lord will do great things. Now, again, just interesting, isn't it? Play on words here. This invasion of locusts, the very last words of verse 20, because he hath done great things. So certainly when the plague came through first time, it did great things. It devastated the land. It, the threat of it the second time, it would seem, did great things. What were the great things it did? Well, maybe if it brought God's people to repentance, that was a great thing, isn't it? In other words, God using it in that way was a great thing. Whatever God uses to bring us to a place of brokenness and usefulness is a great thing in our life. It might not feel like it. A locust invasion didn't feel like a great thing, but it was a great thing because it had great impact. 
And he said, now, because they did great things, the Lord will do great things. And it's interesting how the Lord is speaking to the land. Fear not, O land. It's not the Lord speaking directly to the people in the first person, as he has been up to now. Rather, the prophet by the Holy Spirit speaks about the Lord and addresses respectively the land in verse 21. He's going to talk to the beasts of the field in verse 22. And then in verse 23, he's going to talk to the children of Zion. So the Lord's speaking through the prophet, addressing the land, the beasts, and then the children of Israel. Now, the word land here that's used is, is not the normal word. It's actually the word for soil. Uh, it's, it's almost like the Lord is personifying the soil and talking about the soil sharing in the joy of deliverance and restoration. It has been ravished, uh, ravaged by these uh, locust plagues. And now he says, fear not, O land or O soil, be glad and rejoice, for the Lord will do great things. It's interesting how God often prophetically, in prophetic writings, he, he personifies things. So, for instance, here's another one where he personifies the trees of the field. In Isaiah 55, I'll just read this verse quickly. Isaiah 55 and verse 12, again, where there's this personification of something that we would not think of in that in those terms it says uh, it says for you shall go out with joy this is isaiah 55 verse 12 and be led forth with peace the mountains and the hills shall break forth before you into singing now again we don't tend to think of mountain singing but then it says this all the trees of the field shall clap their hands now, again, what are they talking about? Well, it's just going to, the idea is this, that joy is being restored to a land that has been under a heavy oppression and the joy is coming back to this land. And so God is, is going to do great things in restoring fertility to the soil that has been devastated by this locust plague. And it's assured that the Lord is going to do great things. Just as the Northern Army had done great things. The, uh, the, um, the land has previously mourned. Now it's going to rejoice. Again, just look at back in chapter 1, verse 10. The earth shall quake. This is chapter, sorry, chapter 1, verse 10. It says, the field is wasted, the land mourneth. For the corn is wasted, the new wine is dried up, the oil languishes. So the land mourns. Now the land is rejoicing. Not only the land, but also the livestock. In verse 22, he says, Be not afraid, ye beasts of the field, for the pastures of the wilderness do spring, for the tree bears a fruit, the fig tree, the vine do yield their strength. So it begins with uh, the beasts of the field. And again, the animals uh, also had suffered Chapter 1, verse 18, how do the beasts groan? The herds of cattle are perplexed because they have no pasture. Yea, the flocks of sheep are made desolate. Now God in the restoration mode is restoring to them the pastures that they were deprived of. And so uh, they, they, they don't have to be fearful anymore. Where are they going to find forage? Where are they going to find food? It's, it's there. It's available for them. And so be not afraid, you beasts of the field. And then, of course, uh, he talks uh, about the, the trees and um, not only the animals, but also the, the trees. They also had suffered. If you remember back in chapter 1, verse 12, the vine is dried up. Chapter 1, 12, the fig tree languisheth, the pomegranate tree, the palm tree also, the apple tree from even all the trees of the field are withered because joy is withered away from the sons of men. And now again, God in restoration mode it says, for the tree bears her fruit, the fig tree and the vine do yield their strength. And again, by the way of spiritual application, when, when spiritual life is barren, the word of God ceases to become green pastures to our souls. Bible reading becomes routine and ritualistic. We're going through the motions if we read the scriptures at all, but in times of renewal, of, of renewed spiritual life, when we turn to the Lord in brokenness, 
suddenly the word of God becomes alive to us. And we can become like the psalmist who says, Oh, how I love thy law. It is my meditation all the day. And so it's wonderful, isn't it, to have that spiritual renewal and refreshment so that our pasture is just verdant and green as we, we, we love the word of God and feed on it. And then, of course, the trees being restored to fruitfulness. Again, spiritual application, the fruit of the spirit evident in the people of God, fruitful lives, fruitful service, fruit for God, uh, sweetness rather than sourness amongst the people of God is restored, just as uh, the fruit of the trees. And so a restoration of of fruitfulness is a wonderful thing. And so verse 23, be, be glad then. Now we've moved from the land to the pasture, to the trees, now to the children of Zion. Be glad then, you children of Zion. Rejoice in the Lord your God, for he hath given you the former rain moderately, moderately, and he will cause to come down for you the rain, the former rain, and the latter rain in the first month. So the citizens of Zion should now see the ar arrival of the essential supplies of rainfall. Remember we said it wasn't just a locust plague, but there was also a drought that the people endured. And and so as a result of the drought, the land was, was, was barren. And so now, instead of drown, a, a drought, there's rainfall in the appropriate seasons. And I like the way it says moderately. It's kind of interesting that there's something about a soft rain that somehow the land absorbs so much better than a very profuse, heavy rain. Uh, I notice here we sometimes we get rainfall in the summertime, but it's just absolute pours down and what it does is because the land is so hard it just runs off it and goes into the drainage ditches and is lost basically but when you have a soft rain it, it penetrates beautifully and so the lord is saying i'm going to send this moderately just this beautiful soft rain that will restore the moisture to the, the dry earth and so uh, they could re now rejoice because it, the former rain and the latter rain, each in his season, both were necessary. The former rains in late October or early November preparing the ground for sowing and the latter rain in March or April brought the crops to full maturity. Now, I just want to say something as an aside here just quickly. You'll often hear the terms the latter rain movement. I don't know if you've ever heard that. Uh, in Pentecostal circles particularly. And uh, don't be taken in by it. Uh, they, they'll use this scripture, you see, and they'll say that the former reigns, that was the Pentecost, you know, the day of Pentecost, the coming of the Spirit. And then the latter reigns is the restoration of the Pentecostal movement. And so they'll talk about this, this latter reign revival. But along with that, they believe in the restoration of the fivefold office Apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, teachers, and so you got. That's why you have so many charismatics that call themselves apostles, because again, it's this this idea, this latter rain theology, has absolutely nothing whatsoever to do with Joel's prophecy. It's somebody jumping off a text into hyperspace uh, to justify their own position. And beware of people that do that, right? Taking scriptures out of context. This has got nothing to do with. Uh, the latter-day Pentecostal movement whatsoever. And so it's just God is restoring refreshment. Uh, but spiritually, we could say it, it is wonderful after a dry time, spiritually, when the Lord restores his people and brings a moisture once again to the meetings where there's there's genuine tears of affection for the Lord Jesus. There's just a there's just a, a, a freshness about the meetings of the people of God. This, this is a wonderful thing. We want that. We long for that. The Lord, deliver us from dryness and barrenness and staleness and dustiness. And Lord, bring the moisture of genuine affection back to our meetings. We long for that. Verse 24, it says, The floor shall be full of wheat and the... Uh, fat shall overflow with wine and oil. God is bringing to them fullness instead of famine, excess instead of emptiness. Both harvest the grain uh, and the grape are going to yield an abundant supply. Bountiful harvest successfully gathered in. 
See, so you could have a ripe harvest, but if you get rains at the wrong time, could be ruined. You get certain storms come through, could be no. The, the the point here is that God is in this restoration, He's allowing them to actually gather in and store the harvest. That's a wonderful thing. So the threshing floors are full of wheat. The wine fats are overflowing with wine and oil. And again, wine is symbolic of joy. And so again, revival brings with it a genuine harvest, lasting harvest, but it also brings with it overflowing joy. And oh, how we need that joy unspeakable, full of glory, Oh, that our joy might be full. That's what the Lord wants for us. That's his, that's his desire for us. Uh, and so uh, ever his desire. Joy, and, and I'm just I'm not going to turn here because our time is racing by, but, but you might look these up in Philippians. Joy in prayer. Joy in devotion. Uh, joy in prayers, Philippians 1.4. Joy in devotion, Philippians 1.25 through 27. Joy in each other, just enjoying one another, uh, Philippians 4 verse 1. Joy in studying God's word, Jeremiah 15 verse 16, when Jeremiah said that his word was to him the joy and rejoicing of his heart. Even joy in trials, James chapter 1 verse 2, count it all joy when you fall into various trials. And so, Wonderful, wonderful thing to have joy. In fact, the joy of the Lord is our strength. May God restore to his people joy in every area. It's just a wonderful thing. And so renewal of harvest, renewal of joy, uh, just so many ways that God is restoring. In fact, here is a verse we often love to quote, and it's a beautiful verse, but notice what it says. And I will restore to you the years that the locust hath eaten, cankerworm and the caterpillar and the palmer worm, my great army, which I sent among you. So the Lord is resumed speaking again in first person, right? So it's not the prophet speaking as he's moved by the Holy Spirit. Now the Lord is speaking and he's saying, I will restore to you the years the locust has eaten. God is promising to restore that which was taken away in chastisement. When the locusts did their work, it looked complete and final. But God promised that he could even restore the years that the swarming locusts had eaten. Because it strikes you at once, the locusts didn't eat the years. <laughs> they ate the crops. They ate the fruits of the years. Uh, <clears throat> what the Lord is saying is this. You may not got the, you could be backslidden for 20 years. And the Lord is not saying, I'm going to necessarily give you 20 years extra life because you wasted 20 years. But I can restore to you fruitfulness like you would have had in 20 years of faithfulness in one go. That's what he's restoring. It's the fruitfulness that the Lord is restoring to his people. And so, it's a wonderful thing that he's able to restore to us the years of locusts has eaten, restore to us those fruitfulness where there was once barrenness. The same God who commissioned the locusts to come, now his people have repented, will reimburse with full payment all the costs involved. It's reminiscent a little bit of the book of Job, that after his heart-rending losses, the Lord turned his fortunes and doubled Job uh, at the end, Job 42, if you want to read it, we'll take time later, 10 through 13. Uh, it's just amazing how the Lord restored those things to Job. But also in this scripture, this promise of restoration, there is a reminder of the horrors they went through. Notice it says, I'll restore to you the years of locusts have eaten. And then he mentions the canker worm, the caterpillar, the palmer worm, my great army which I sent amongst you. The four uh, descriptions that we found right at the very opening of this uh, this book of Joel, uh, when in verse 4, the palmer worm and the locusts and the canker worm and the caterpillar are mentioned. Now they're mentioned again. And so again, it would. there's a certain sense, isn't it, when we're restored, it's not, it's not easy to forget 
those wasted years and the heartache of those wasted years. And so the, there's a reminder here of their backslidden days, <laughs> but also there's a beautiful promise of God's restoration that he will restore those wasted years. And it's good to know that God can do better than we could ever ask or think possible in his restoring grace. It's wonderful beyond comprehension, his restoring grace. And so it says in verse 26, and you shall eat in plenty and be satisfied and praise the name of the Lord your God that hath dealt wondrously with you and my people shall never be ashamed. The people now in the midst of plenty, fully satisfied, enjoying this rest, restored condition and never forgetting the source of all their blessings. And so they're eating in plenty, they're satisfied, and they are praising the name of the Lord your God. Isn't that wonderful? And so it, it, it results in genuine worship. They're not going to forget this restoration. I was with a brother recently who had been away from the Lord and made some terrible decisions. He's now fully restored to the Lord and just to see the joy in his face. And yet there's at the same time a reminder of his wasted years, but, but yet an exuberant joy at God's great restoring grace. And he's full of praise for what the Lord has done for him. And you should hear him at the Lord's Supper. It's just a delight. There's such a sense of amazement at how God has kindly dealt with him despite his waywardness. And that's true of all of us. Prone to wander off, we feel it. Prone to leave the God we love. And so what's interesting is that fullness of bread sometimes can lead to emptiness of soul, can't it? Uh, the sins of Sodom were included abundance of bread and abundance of idleness. But in this case, because of restoration, <laughs> This fullness is not uh, leaving them uh, doing things wrong, but just amazed at God's restoring grace. And so they, they use terms here like wondrously. Uh, it, it's just a beautiful one to denote amazement at divine, God's divine accomplishment. Uh, they were objects of disdain and ridicule by the nations. Shame covered their faces. Now songs of gratitude fill their mouths. And there's a genuine renewal of heartfelt worship because of what God has done in his mercy and restoring grace. And verse 27, he says, you shall know that I am in the midst of Israel and that I am the Lord your God and none else, my people shall never be ashamed. So God's presence now silences the heathen objectors. His presence is clearly amongst the people. The question was, where is their God? The answer is he's right in the midst. <laughs> he's right here with us. He's dwelling in the midst of his people and they'll never be ashamed. Of course, we have to say that the things that are described here seem to point forward to a future day for Israel because we can see that in many ways, um, Israel is still the reproach of much of the world, but there is coming a final day, isn't there? This is, we're kind of beginning to really look forward now to the end times when God will finally bring his wayward people back, fully restore them, and then they will never be ashamed. And they're going to be, uh, again, they're, they're going to be, instead of the heel of the nations, they're going to be the head of the nations. And so God is going to restore them and again, we just remind ourselves, our time is almost gone. I want to just say a couple of things. First of all, the Lord wounds and, and, and they're faithful wounds. Faithful are the wounds of a friend. It's because God loves us that he chastens us. The Lord wounds, but he also heals. And oh, how wonderfully does he heal when he restores the backslider. And again, we might just uh, say this, that if you've lived through this, God doesn't want you spending your final years lamenting over those wasted years. Yeah, never forget them. Never forget the betrayal and the things you, but enter into a life of fruitfulness for the Lord now with great thanksgiving for his restoring mercies. It's a wonderful thing to do this. 
And so may God encourage us as we consider God the Restorer. Amen.